IMF headquarters in Washington, D.C., where we continue to cover 2024 spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank Group. I'm Amin Mohseni, macroeconomist at the Geo Economic Center at the Atlantic Council, where I lead the Bretton Woods 2.0 project focusing on providing new perspectives on global economy and its governance structure. At the core of our research is the role of the private sector in financing the global development agenda. Current levels of investment in clean energy and nature-based solutions are at a fraction of what is needed to achieve the SDG targets by 2030 and net zero targets by 2050. There are different estimates out there, uh, but certainly those estimates are in the tens of trillions of dollars. To address this shortfall, private investment is necessary, but for private capital to come in, there has to be incentives for the private actors, and therefore the guarantee question comes in. And guarantees are widely considered as the most effective mechanism to mobilize private sector investment and to incentivize their engagement in providing global, uh, well, global development uh, agenda. So the World Bank Group has announced a major reorganization and expansion of its guarantee program, otherwise known as MIGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee uh, Agency. And, uh, and the idea is to uh, bring in all the different guarantees across the World Bank under one roof and in a one-stop shop for the clients. Adi but additional guarantee facilities are going to be needed, including guarantee facilities that are structured so that the client countries are not uh, burdened by excessive amounts of debt. To address these uh, various topics, today I am pleased to have Ken Berlin, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, and Christopher Edgerton Warburton, also known as EDGE, here uh, with us. Uh, he's a funding partner at Lions Head Global Partners. Welcome to our studios, and thank you for being with us today. <coughs> thank you. So EDGE, let me start with you. Uh, so it is well known that the current levels of investment in clean energy falls very short from what is needed. And uh, to add to, and, and can you share some of your perspectives on what is being introduced as so what sort of guarantee measures out there uh, to increase substantial, to increase the uh, private investment level substantially? So I think the mistake is to think that there is no, um, that there aren't projects to do. The reality is there's, uh, if people know what needs to happen, there's actually a lot of capital which would be interested in investing in, into projects and programs. The challenge comes that you've got to, particularly in the energy space, create uh, a, a product at the end of the day which is um, competitive on a global basis. So it's no good uh, locking yourself into a 30-year power contract that is at a price which is unaffordable for your citizens and means that all your businesses uh, can never compete with, with everybody else around the world. Mm -hmm. So the challenge that we have is the places which need um, which need new power and these trillions of dollars that you're talking about are the places which are deemed uh, the most risky to invest in and and therefore we have this cycle that just keeps continuing and the capital is sitting there saying we would invest if the if the projects were structured and, and were put together but um, the sort of returns that we need to take if we're just going in kind of naked as it were are simply make the output unaffordable and so you end up with this crazy circle where people go back to uh, the capitals and say, well, will you provide a subsidy or a feed-in tariff mm -hmm. or some form of um, way to, to make the, 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 the power more affordable? And that then, um, you know, you end up back here with the IMF because the IMF are then having conversations with those ministries of finance saying, well, you're taking on all these contingent liabilities. So we have, at the moment, the status quo in using business as usual uh, basically is not working. Yes. Um, but that's not that there aren't projects to do and, 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 and things to, 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 to work on. So I think what's exciting about the current conversations is how do we unblock that logjam? And the reality is it's about um, placing risk and covering risk um, 
with the people who are best positioned to, to take that risk and understand that risk. Um, these are not projects that people, uh, this is not like building something that um, has no revenue stream. This is not like building schools or, or hospitals that, that are obviously needed and necessary. But this is generating a, a product that people will want, if it's the right price, people want to buy. And, and there is demand for that power. We've seen the same and there's demand for mobile phones. You know, you can go to the craziest places in the world and you people are still using, uh, are using mobile phones. So how do they power those mobile phones? They need electricity. Um, so the demand is there and people will pay for it, but we need to find ways of um, bringing down the risk so that the cost of capital then becomes, becomes affordable. And that's where guarantees come in. That's where guarantees come yes, in. Yes, yes. So uh, Ken, the Atlantic Council has introduced a proposal called the Emerging Market Climate Investment Compact, otherwise known as EMCIC. Can you share more about the facility and how it, how it could interact with what the World Bank is doing out there? Yes, um, and thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, what we've tried to do at the Atlantic Council in, the, in developing this, we call it EMSIC proposal, is to figure out a way to massively scale up investment by private investors. And consistent with what we've been saying, the, the, the way to do that is to figure out how to reduce the risk to investors so they're incentivized and they're comfortable going in and, do, and doing these projects. Because we also agree that there are, they, that there are projects out there. Doing that also has other profound benefits. I mean, if you can lower the risk, you can lower the interest rates that are charged in the country, that lowers the cost to the, to the consumers of the country. And it's also very important from a uh, equity standpoint because you don't want the developed world building projects at 5% interest rate and the developing world at 10% interest rate. So the proposal we've developed um, is a very ambitious proposal because you really have to scale up investment massively as we've been saying. So we, we have proposed a uh, $500 billion 10-year loan guarantee facility with the loans coming from governments and maybe foundations, private and, uh, and, and maybe uh, sovereign wealth funds to, to, to provide the funds in there. 500 billion sounds like a massive number. Mm -hmm. but when you break it down, it, it doesn't turn out to be. First of all, the, the beauty of, of guarantees and the reason they become the leading um, uh, mechanism that people are looking at to scale up investment is that they can be leveraged. So when you have a guarantee, what you need to do is you need to have cash in the facility you're working on sufficient to cover the expected losses from the investments you're doing. So let's say the expected loss is a 10%. That's pretty high. Some places are five, some are higher. Mm -hmm. But let's say it's a 10% expected loss. So if you have a $500 billion facility, you've got to ultimately have $50 billion in cash into that facility. You've got to have some backup for unexpected losses, maybe balance sheet guarantees, but you, have, but you need $50 billion in cash. If it's a 10-year facility, that means you need $5 billion a year put into the facility. And if you have, let's say, 10 countries doing that, that's only $500 million a year by the countries. Now, maybe a country like the U.S. would put in more than an equal percentage. But still, that's a number that, given the U.S. commitments, is, I think is, is a very, very doable number in that. Then the question becomes, how does this fit in with what the World Bank is doing? The World mm -hmm. Bank has always been a leader in catalyzing investment in the developing world. But its process has not been very user-friendly to private investments. It's a very slow process to get, to get to, they, do, they do do guarantees. It's a slow process to get the guarantees approved. They do their own due diligence. Um, and the result is, is not, and they also have right now, I think, 20 different guarantee proposals, yes. pr programs in, in the World Bank. So the World Bank has this new proposal that you're talking about designed to consolidate these programs, I think by sort of setting up a horizontal structure where MEGA uh, manages it and all the, all the uh, groups work together. It's proposed to greatly um, speed up its process, although we have to see how it does it and whether it can do that, do that very, very effectively. And it's proposed to increase its uh, investment, uh, its base investment for the guarantees to $20 billion. But that's still only a fraction of what's needed. And you know, given the World Bank commitments and many other commitments besides energy, they're not going to be able to run the World Bank only as an energy um, guaranteeing facility. So there is a need for supplemental facilities. Again, recognizing the importance and critical nature of what the World Bank does. So we propose this MSIC as the alternative. And we've tried to set it up in a way that's very, very user-friendly to business. 
Um, and the way we've done it is, first of all, we want to cover the risks that need to be covered to ensure that um, the investment committees and whoever the investors are feel the project is investment grade, however they define that. Uh, you know, not, not on a bun level, but however they, however they define investment grade. They would still have some skin in the game, which they need to do for the reasons I'll say in a minute. But the goal is to, is to reduce the risk enough to do that. Then we've tried to develop an extremely efficient procedure. We will pre-qualify an investor. So let's say it's a BlackRock or a Goldman or somebody else. We will go to them and they will qualify as a facility that will receive investments. Mm -hmm. And what we're pre-qualifying is they will then agree to do a portfolio of projects. And we will, we will um, guarantee losses in the, in the portfolio uh, that, that, they're, uh, that they put together. Um, they, we will then develop a set of standards, environmental standards, uh, uh, social standards, um, uh, equity standards, uh, inv um, risk um, involvement standards by local communities that the banks will have to meet, including very detailed environmental standards, that they will have to meet as they do their loans. But then they will go out, the investment firm are guaranteeing, will go out and do all the due diligence. Mm -hmm. They will do the due diligence based on our standards. They will still have some risk. We will only come in and double check what they're doing. We right. will be able to spot check what they're doing. We won't repeat it. We won't do our own environmental impact statement each time. Mm -hmm. We're comfortable with that because we think that these are large investors that if they have some skin in the game, you know, they want this project to work as well as we do. So we're confident that they will do you know, a good job on that and we will pre-qualify them first to make sure we're comfortable with that. Um, we think that's an uh, extremely efficient procedure and it will attract tremendous interest from the banks. So we're designed to attract this interest, guarantee the loans so they're comfortable going in, and they will then go in and do the work. There's no, the, the, the country itself where the loan is going in, they don't receive our guarantees, so they don't receive any, they don't get any contingent liability for what we're doing. Right. Then we'll have the project, which may be another issue, but so our guarantees go to the, to the private investors, um, and hopefully we, that will enable them to massively scale up. The one other thing we're doing on that is we will require a few basis points to go into a fund to build capacity in the country we're working in. So we're, we're paying attention to that. And we, you know, we want to make sure that, the, that our investors work with the local banks, with local investors, mm -hmm. um, and with the local communities. Yes, yes. You actually answered some of my questions on due diligence and working in a short timeline frame right. uh, uh, in, in, your, in your response. But $500 billion is, is, com is almost nothing uh, compared to the uh, around 70 to $80 trillion in sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. And that's what we're also arguing that these institu uh, institutional investors, they have a long-term investment horizons right. that definitely matches with you know, larger scale infrastructural projects. It's just a matter of you know, creating the, the framework and the platform for that capital to come in and, and, and guaranteeing uh, some return for them. So uh, Ken, uh, MIGA is thinking about using uh, a form of portfolio guarantee, and also uh, MSEC is uh, proposing that as well. Can this approach and concept streamline the process of getting uh, deals across the finish line in a timely manner? And how might this approach uh, help finance clean energy projects? So um, the, the short answer is clearly yes. Um, but, but let's unpack that a little bit. Sure. I mean, the, uh, this, this space is moving. We saw um, some very ambitious uh, announcements at COP uh, in, in the Emirates uh, last year yes. around um, trying to mobilize uh, the sovereign wealth funds, particularly out of, um, of, of Abu Dhabi and, and, and the UAE, mm -hmm. <coughs> to, um, to start investing equity into um, into uh, the clean energy projects. And the numbers that were being batted around were in the hundreds of billions of, yes. of dollars. Now, those hundreds of billions of dollars would get leveraged into you know, a, a trillion dollars worth of investment. Now, the reality is that um, you know, a number of, of asset managers were chosen, which, which, would, which would meet your, your criteria, Ken. But um, they need, um, they need projects and, 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 and places to invest that capital. And left uh, to its own devices, all of that money will flow into the global north. Mm -hmm. Because exactly. um, that is where the scale is, that's where the, um, the mass of these projects make sense. And you, all you will do is sort of increase the, 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 the delta between 
um, the, the, the north and the south, and we know the ramifications that that has, whether it's in immigration and, mm -hmm. and, and, and many other, other factors. So what MEGA is trying to do, I think, is the, it's one of the few institutions that has the scale to be able to match the, um, this potential uh, wall of, 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 of resource that, that, that is being uh, starting to be allocated into this space. Many people would say too little, too late, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's, the, the, the money is actually now there. So, but, but the projects, it won't go to the projects that we want it to go to unless you have groups uh, like MEGA who turn around and say, we're here to, in a sense, level the playing field. This is about saying, um, you, yes, you could do that project in Canada, or you could do it in Malaysia. But you know what? If you do it in Egypt, it will be uh, even more impactful, and we can help you cover that risk. Or in um, you know all the all the various different countries that we know. And unless that happens, the mm -hmm. you know all the targets that we have for, for 2030 just will not be uh, will not be met. The the reality is. People don't understand. I mean, like, I don't think MEGA has ever had a default, or if it has, it's you know, so tiny. Um, this this insurance, um, it's like you're putting a policeman in in the room. At that point, no crime ever gets committed because for a country to take on a MEGA guarantee, they are effectively uh, committing that um, here's a contract, we're going to honor it, and and we will make it work. So. It's, it's proven to be an incredibly efficient tool because the, um, they're, they're not the, the sh it, it really has not been burdening the shareholders because it's not like these things are being called. Because it's like everybody is standing there saying, we want this the project to work. We will stand behind uh, the, the commitments and agreements that we've made. The investors get the comfort that this will survive political cycles. It will not be suddenly someone will wake up on a, on a rainy Wednesday and say, well, mm -hmm. why, did we that, why did we sign that? So, right. And, and it's actually surprising a lot less expensive than people think. We structured a renewable energy deal in the DRC. And um, in reality, we were working with a group who, who, who wanted to do the project, but it really wasn't, weren't 100% uh, comfortable with you know, what might happen looking you know, five, 10 years out in, in the DRC. And MEGA came in said, we, all, we, can, we can cover that risk for you. Suddenly, everybody was like, well, that's going to cost a fortune. We were blown away when people looked at the, uh, at the ultimate costs and, um, and said, well, this is a no-brainer. This, mm -hmm. this unlocks the project, helps everybody, gives everybody a lot of confidence. And the and Amiga turn around and say, well, we're confident that if, if, if the following ministries have all signed off on this, we're, we're not gonna, we don't have to charge the earth because actually we know that we, we, will, not, we will not get called on, on this guarantee. Right. So the, the trick is that how do we, in a sense, not have all this sitting as a liability for, for the government? So at the moment, if you have a mega guarantee, um, you know, you're consuming, in a sense, uh, part of the allocation, the, cap the scarce capital allocation of the multilateral development banks for these different countries. And that, 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 that resource is finite, and it's, you know, countries uh, want to use that for the best purpose. So the trick is, can we use um, various guarantee programs that, in a sense, increase that headroom and take that liability out of um, the, the, the sovereigns. The, the GDP of, of sub-Saharan Africa is $3 trillion. Yes. So we're talking about you know, trillions of dollars of investment that need to go in. You're talking about 100% of GDP. There's no way that can just sit on the balance sheets of those countries. So we need, and why initiatives like this are particularly interesting is because it's finding a place where that ultimate liability is not sitting on the balance sheet of the countries in which these projects are happening. Because if that's what we're relying on, the math is simple. Exactly. It doesn't add up. Definitely, definitely. Can I, can I just... Uh, of course, of course, please. Yeah, talk a little bit about portfolios directly. I mean, there's yes. two advantages of portfolio, and one critical issue is setting up a portfolio. The advantage, of course, are that spreads the risk in the yes. guarantee you're doing. But it also, in, in the way we're looking at it, it, it requires a commitment by the investors to do a significant amount of investment in emerging markets and developing countries. 
And one of our goals in this is that after 10 years, the companies will be far more comfortable um, investing in the emerging markets. There'll now be enough information, there'll now be enough experience that they can continue either without guarantees or you know you can have new new facilities to deal with that. But the goal is to get them really comfortable in these investments and part of that is just experience. Definitely. So so that's the goal. Now the tricky thing about this is you asked the question of whether the guarantee you know helps speed up the process and all that. The answer is yes, but only if your if oh, the portfolio, I'm sorry, but only if the portfolio is treated as a portfolio. In other words, the reason we're pre-qualifying the investor mm -hmm. is that we only have to do that once. If you have a portfolio, but you have to pre-qualify, you have to qualify the investor for that portfolio, mm -hmm. then you have to do specific due diligence on that portfolio. The portfolio advantage is lost on that. Mm -hmm. So for us, the portfolio gives us the advantage of multi multiple, multiple investments, one approval of the investor, they do the due diligence and then we spot check, which again, we think is going to be a very, very efficient process. Right, right. Edge, you said some, some say too little, too late, but I would say better late than never on, on this issue because yeah. it's, it's a pressing challenge. We mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 600 million people they still lack access to basic electricity uh, grid. Uh, so, uh, I mean, even, for, uh, even putting, away the, uh, putting aside the clean energy transition, just having access to basic infrastructure, mm. right, the, the investment gap is huge uh, for many parts, of, in many parts of the world. So, uh, we are running a bit of, uh, almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you if you have, uh, when it comes to MSEC, I specifically can, uh, can this uh, uh, facility that we have, that, that MSEC is uh, proposing, can it also be applied to other nature-based solutions such as forests, uh, forest carbon trading, uh, carbon sinks, and debt for nature? Uh, yes, we're, we're looking at that pretty carefully now. We're about to publish a paper in the next week or two on forest credit trading. Okay. And it's difficult right now because forest credit trading is basically mostly based on a project-by-project -project basis. And a lot of those projects have been very controversial. So it's sort of hard to figure out, you know, it may be hard to figure out when to give a guarantee on that. We, we are actually critical of the project by project approach and suggest that forest credit trading become, uh, a be based on jurisdictional considerations. In other words, you would get a credit if you as a jurisdiction decreased your emissions. So in other words, it could be the state of Amazonas in Brazil, it could be Brazil, it could be an indigenous, an indigenous nation within Amazonas. Once you get to that level, where the, you've got a jurisdiction that has the credits and then it's selling them to somebody, we could then guarantee the person who's buying them that the credit, that the credit is good. So we're looking at how to do that, mm -hmm. looking at, looking at, nature, at uh, debt for nature swaps. Can you do guarantees on that? So in other words, anywhere where there's a, com uh, somebody, there's a buyer coming in, there's risk to the buyer, we have the potential to address that, I think, in MSEC. Looking forward to that report. Yes. <laughs> uh, any, any final thoughts, Edge, as we are closing here? Well, just to say, I mean, I've been uh, involved in this space and, and, you know, thank you again for, for having me here. But, I mean, we've been having these conversations for 20 years. Yes. Um, I remember being uh, at a, a similar meeting here in sort of 2008, 2009, wow. and the number of people without electricity in Africa was 600 million then. Yes. You know, the reality is we're keeping up with the new birth cohorts that are coming through, but we're not, we're, we're, we're not accelerating it. The, the, the forest that you're just talking about, uh, it was known back, it was clear back then that the, uh, this was the lowest cost source of, um, uh, of, of carbon abatement, and the, the deforestation mm -hmm. was adding about a gigaton of, of CO2 into the atmosphere every year try and abate a gigaton of, of CO2. There is no, there's just no other way of doing it. And mm -hmm. so I think it's exciting that we're now at a time when um, some creative solutions are being mm -hmm. thought about of, of moving the needle meaningfully uh, in, in energy supply and in, uh, in stopping, in a sense, the self-harm that uh, the deforestation is, is, is happening. The, the last thing just to say, we've all been deforesting as part of our economic development. Every country has globally for since the beginning of mankind first figured out how to chop down a tree. So 
Um, to expect that suddenly the, we're going to stop this and, and, in a sense, send economic growth backwards mm -hmm. is, um, is, is, is not going to happen. So the challenge is how do we find ways where the forests become worth more uh, standing and performing the function that you know, nature put them there for? Uh, and I think that's an area where there's a lot of very interesting work go going on at the moment. Yeah. Can I just give a very quick, can, yes. very quick Please, optimistic uh, quote? I, I don't remember who said this. This is not something I made up, but um, change happens slower than you think it will, but when it happens, it happens faster than you thought it would. Exactly. And so the hope here is that we've now, we're now at that critical stage where everything is coming together, yes. and we can now start moving very, very quickly and start scaling up. We do need mechanisms like EMSIC and other guarantees and what the World Bank is doing, so we all have to work together on this. Definitely, uh, on, on that, on that uh, mark, uh, the boiling water, right, it takes time for right. it to come to that 100 degrees Celsius, yeah. but when, when it hits it, it starts boiling suddenly, yep. right? So I, I also hope that all the forces are coming in uh, to make this change happen. Uh, we are a few uh, years away from that 1.5 degrees Celsius target or 2 degrees Celsius target, yeah. so the time is of essence here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, Ken and Edge, Edge, especially you that you flew from London to here. You had to wait in long queues to get into the US. Uh, a lot of food for thought for all of us. And uh, tune in for more at uh, hashtag future of econ and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.